All right, we'll get started. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Rother, Chair of the Department of Medicine here at McMaster. Welcome to the first of the Chair's Grand Rounds of 2024. And also thank you to our inaugural, inaugural uh, use of noon on Thursdays at rounds. We've changed the time for all of the medical rounds, both the hospital and the university rounds till noon on Thursday to accommodate to um, sign over requirements for the residents in the morning. So thank you to those of you who found your way here and um, we will continue at this time frame. Additionally, we will as always be recording these and they'll be available later for review. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank our two speakers today who I will introduce, but who need no introduction. Um, uh, Dominic Mertz, who's the Division Director of uh, Infectious Diseases here at McMaster University, and Zane Chagla, um, who is our resident uh, CBC personality, uh, who both really did immense amounts of unbelievably excellent work during the COVID pandemic, very, very strong, clear, uh, articulate spokespeople for evidence, for best practices, not only in the hospitals um, where each one has put in a lot of time and effort around COVID, but more so nationally, <clears throat> provincially and elsewhere. So thanks to both of you, because you did an awful lot of work. Also coordinating, developing protocols and the pathways that we use to treat patients with COVID-19 over the last four years. I told Dominic, just as we were about to kick off that I was gonna start by just reminiscing briefly about rounds that Dominic did um, right at the start of the pandemic up in the Jurovinsky Auditorium. And I think we called those kind of a special rounds. They were 5 p.m. people attended. Dominic got up there and, and gave us kind of a worst case scenario and in kind of an odd way, it turned out to be much worse than that. <laughs> and I think if the people leaving that room had been asked if that was like kind of doom and gloom and naysaying on Dominic's part, everybody would have said yes. And I think now if people watch the video of that, they'll say, wow, that actually turned out much worse than he predicted. So um, it's it's gonna be really interesting. This is, I asked Dominic and Zane to come together with us today to just talk about it, their, their retrospective as we head into the fourth year of COVID-19. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to them uh, and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat and questions. So if you have a question or if you wanna say something, uh, you can put it in the chat function or the question and answer function. We should have some time to address questions at the end. So thanks. Uh, without further introduction, Dominic and Zane, I think Dominic's starting. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and welcome, everyone. And thanks for the invite to talk about COVID one more time. And we labeled this a look into the past and the present. And I will start off with um, the past. Um, and the way I frame that is as a systematic review of grand rounds and department town halls on COVID that we've done over the years. I have one conflict of interest in of relevance with this talk today. Um, so what I did was like in best COVID manner where rigor was the most important piece in all, all publications and you probably heard my uh, sarcasm there. I did a search of all potentially relevant electronic folders that I had with a very complex search strategy, which was rounds. I identified 210 files of which 196 were clearly irrelevant. I screened 14 in more detail, eight were duplicates. So I ended up with six presentations that meet uh, met eligibility criteria with 379 unique slides of which I first deemed 48 of interest and they had to cut down another 10 to make it into the 25 minutes. Um, these are those six sets of presentations, half of which were um, with saying uh, of splitting the rounds or town halls. What I will do is I provide a qualitative summary of the key themes that uh, we or I talked about uh, do a critical appraisal of what we knew or thought we knew back then in um, with the light of, of what we in the light of what we know nowadays. And in terms of risk of bias and very transparent selective reporting of what I deem most relevant is fully intentional. Um, a note, gray literature or presentation search of Dr. Chabla's slides I've done. There was no dating of those presentations as such, I excluded them. The most common themes are treatments and vaccines that Zane will be covering today anyway. So I will focus on my slides only. Four themes emerged. The first was any news, epidemiology and modeling, and I will first go through that. And 
start off reminding you of the timeline and you will see that um, slide over and over again to give you an idea of um, historic context. Um, so the first presentation that Mark was just referring to at the Trovinsky was uh, the good, the bad and the ugly uh, on March 12, 2020. By then, the novel coronavirus was announced. Uh, the outbreak in the Lombardy and New York were well on the way. Um, the first wave in Ontario sort of just started. We just had the first case in Hamilton a couple of days before um, these, um, these rounds back then. This is how um, the John Hopkins website looked like at that point of time. A lot of red in China, a lot of red in Europe, and just starting off in North America, other than the New, New York area, obviously. In Ontario, we had 36 cases at that point of time. I showed this slide and suggested that more than half of cases were linked to the um, uh, seafood market until it was closed beginning of January. After that, only nine, uh, not, yeah, close to 9% were, were linked. And this combined with the fact that there was more than 96% homology to known bat coronaviruses, the assumption at the time was that it was bat born, um, maybe with the pangolin as an intermediate. I haven't heard a lot about pangolins ever since. Uh, and I wouldn't have expected back then that this is going to be a contentious issue. And whenever you see me um, uh, flipping to the modern times, so to say, you see the more modern TV here to reflect this is like uh, what we found nowadays. So it is a contentious issue still. Um, ChatGPT says it's still unresolved. The energy department in the US says clearly a lab leak. Um, most scientists at least that's my interpretation, still argue, no, it's the same as with any pandemic humankind has faced so far. It originally came from an animal that made the jump into, into humankind. This is that uh, plausible or question mark possible worst case scenario that I painted back then. And uh, let's see how it compares to what really happened. And I don't fully agree with Mark. I think I was overly pessimistic at that time, um, at least for year one. I would have predicted back then somewhere between three and 15 million infections in Canada. Um, we ended up with roughly half a million of confirmed cases. Now we know that we only identified one in five to one in 10. So probably somewhere between 2.5 to 5.5 million infections actually occurred in that year one. Um, mortality, I, uh, despite the fact that I uh, took a, what seemed to be a low rate at the time with a case fatality rate of 1%, we ended up with much less fatalities in that first year, 15,000, the case fatality ratio of 2.7%. By the end of 2023, we were sitting at 56,000 and the case fatality rate of 1.2. But that's obviously a mix of uh, pre-vaccine and post-vaccine era. So I was off, in particular in terms of fatalities, but I wasn't as off as some other folks. Um, coronavirus did not disappear one day like a miracle, as everyone knows. The next uh, presentation was in June 2020. By then, we had our Roslyn outbreak, which was the first time we were facing challenges or um, COVID was make us face challenges in, in Halton specifically. And I presented on updates on EPI, HMPs and PPE. And at that point, I introduced the idea that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 will eventually be uh, one of our common coronavirus, sort of the fifth strain of a endemic coronavirus. And it looks like that's what we headed to. Um, everyone learned about R0 and RT at the time. And I would have argued back then that with the low incidence and prevalence that we have had, uh, RT was uh, heavily influenced and inflated by, by outbreaks, as you can see here with the Roslin outbreak. 
Um, and that touched on the other pandemic, the pandemic of COVID publications. Here, ScienceMap suggested that with the doubling at time of 20 days of COVID papers, we will end up with 50 million COVID papers by the end of the year. It wasn't that bad. It was 90,000 by the end of 2020. Uh, but up to December 2023, uh, close to 400,000 publications on COVID. And then always jokingly said, you only have to put COVID into the title and you get pretty much everything published. Some people looked into this more scientifically and looked at the rigor in those studies. And here, just as an example of a systematic review, they found that only one third of COVID-19 papers compared to three quarters of non-COVID 19 papers were rated as low risk of bias and adherence to reporting guidelines was also um, inferior for COVID papers than non-COVID papers. In September, we focused on knowns and unknowns with an emphasis on unknowns because we felt that if anything, people felt too much that they know what, what's happening. Um, this was like in the beginning of the second wave in Ontario, a couple of days before our Spinco outbreak that people may still remember, which uh, resulted or ended up in the media uh, provincially and nationally. Um, a quick reminder of how the case numbers look like. You see here numbers up to 1,000. Um, and you see the stage-wise reopening that people probably still remember and how we introduced mask mandates um, mid-summer uh, 2020. And then we saw that slight increase going to state three towards the end of August, which interestingly, we kept seeing every year ever since. It was also the time where people started to compare countries, and so did I. Uh, here, eight hypotheses I came up with uh, as to why the U.S. may have faced an earlier second peak than, than us in Canada. Uh, I think it's still indetermined what was or what were the most important factors in resulting in that. Uh, but I think it's a good segue to look into what happened on the long run when you compare those two countries. And this shows you estimated cumulative excess deaths during COVID topping Canada at the bottom in the United States, and you see a much steeper slope in the United States in the beginning, in the pre-vaccine era. That's when they did end up with, with higher mortality rates than we did. In the pre-Omicron, but uh, post-vaccine era, they were still a little higher or steeper in their slope. Where our slope increase compared to the US was um, with the first Omicron wave. Uh, while it started to flatten out in the US. And then later on, since end of 2022, we are again on a similar trajectory as the US. On the right-hand side, I uh, give you the proportion of cumulative excess death per population, which is double of what, uh, of what we have in Canada. And I touched on super spread events, um, which were frequently reported in the media and uh, considered very important in modeling studies. At that time, when we had pretty much everything still shut down where super spread events could happen in Ontario, it wasn't really important uh, in terms of um, transmission. And I would have argued that super spread events do contribute, but are not necessarily the main driver. But super spread events certainly happen. And I wanted to quickly introduce K, the dispersion parameter here. This is a very busy slide, but basically telling you the story of homogeneous versus heterogeneous spread. And if your K is less than one, you have more heterogeneous spread, which we also see, for example, with sexually transmittable diseases, where a small proportion of positives result in the majority of transmissions. And we kept seeing the same with uh, COVID-19 compared to what we would typically see with flu and other respiratory viruses, at least in a non-immune population, whether this is still holding true nowadays. I, I haven't found any data on that, but most studies that they looked at here in this study show the K of less than one, which uh, uh, suggest that there's significant heterogeneity in terms of the likelihood of someone to spread the disease. And then September, we also talked about COVID vaccines for the first time. 
Um, I was wrong here with the first point. Uh, was true up to then, but after that, SARS-CoV-2 uh, taught us that uh, mutations are not going to be rare and minor. We went through alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all the way to Omicron. Um, but since things have slowed down again, um, but we haven't known that at that point of time. And I discussed what can we potentially expect from a vaccine. Optimally, it would have been preventing transmission with at least a chance of potential eradication, which seemed unlikely. Um, that preventing clinical infection or at the minimum prevent severe disease should be the key and uh, to prevent morbidity and mortality. And that will not result in herd immunity and no eradication, obviously. And that's what we ended up with, with our vaccines. And Sane will show more data on that. I also uh, mentioned that there have been reports of reinfections and as such, it seemed unlikely that the vaccine will uh, achieve sterilizing immunity on a long run. I waded in on the challenge of the logistics of vaccinating 8 billion people uh, across the globe, and that this will likely take years, which it did. And I don't have to touch on the inequities in how those vaccines have been rolled out globally. And then the discussion about who to vaccinate first. And as you may remember, we had a sort of a mix of high risk professions and highest risk individuals as uh, the first to, to get the vaccines. A common theme, and Sane will touch more on that, is that the vaccines are great in preventing mortality and hospitalization, not so much to prevent uh, symptomatic infections. The effect veins much more than for those other types and even less so for asymptomatic transmission. But I leave that to Sane to discuss in more detail. In May 2021, we had an update uh, at Medicine Town Hall here. Um, that was like in the middle of the third wave in Ontario, uh, also dubbed as the ICU wave, which was probably the most challenging that we went through in terms of COVID that spring of 2021. Um, what we didn't know at that point is that we were past peak. Um, and it was the one time that the, the provincial modeling was actually overly optimistic and we ended up with a, um, a scenario that was worse than what was anticipated at just before Easter back then. The good news was, and that's what I shared um, on May 3rd, is that the red line shows you in terms of ICU um, capa capacity use that we started to see a decrease and this ended up being the trend. So eventually we did better than even the best case scenario there, but it was the most challenging times nevertheless, as probably everyone can remember. In September 2021, um, start of the fourth wave in Ontario, which was a Delta wave. Um, again, COVID, what is new? I discussed the different sh uh, shapes and sizes of Delta waves uh, across the Northern Hemisphere um, and that neither vaccination rates nor Oxford stringencies index could easily predict how those uh, waves looked like and that there's probably many other factors that heavily influence and are sort of out of control uh, in terms of how uh, that delta wave or alpha wave earlier would have um, played out. Um, and the takeaway being continue to vaccinate and maybe a combination with some level of public health measures uh, to get through the winter of 2021-2022. I think this slide aged quite well as well. This was, again, September 2021, uh, where we had a lot of, again, worst case scenario, social media, but also media reports. Um, and I think the only thing that changed also looking at this year is, it's not Twitter, it's now X, but beyond that, I think that theme still happens quite a bit. The second theme I wanted to talk about, or I talked about quite a bit, was serology, CFR, so case fatality ratio, infection fatality ratio, and excess mortality. Um, so going back to March 12, 2020, I shared these case fatality ratios that were anywhere from 0% in Sweden, Belgium, Norway, and Singapore to 5% in Italy, mostly driven by the uh, major outbreak in the Lombardy. Um, and I would have said that the main reason for those differences is case finding. 
um, because the more less symptomatic individuals you identify, the lower your case fatality ratio will be. And that explained probably the difference between us with 1.3% at the time and the US with 3.6%. Now, John Hopkins closed down the dashboard in March this year. Um, we got close to 7 million COVID-associated deaths globally uh, up to now. That's roughly 1% of known cases of a case fatality ratio of 1% and 0.0875% of the world population. September we, 2020, we also had our first serology studies, and we had roughly 1% of, uh, of the population being seropositive at the time, which was four to five times higher in Ontario and eight times higher than expected based on known cases uh, in BC. In contrast to New York, which was in certain neighborhoods as high as more than 50% uh, seropositivity at that point of time. And that serology data allowed you to estimate infection fatality ratios. And I think this study aged very well, which shows that's very significant age gradient with the infection fatality ratio estimated to be one in 10,000, the young population, including pediatrics, uh, getting to roughly 1% in the 60 year old age group, and then uh, all the way up to one in three in the 85 plus age group. This is pre-vaccine and pre-effective treatment, obviously, and uh, SANE will share some um, post-vaccine uh, data as well on that. You will see those two slides as well in, um, in SANE's presentation, um, but you can calculate your infection fatality ratio for Canada based on serology data, and it's somewhere between 0.15 to 0.2%. We talked very little about public health measures other than in uh, the very first uh, presentation uh, for March 2020, but um, quite a bit on travel and I will focus on that uh, in the third part. So in March 2020, I introduced the concept of what can be done in terms of public health measures and how the interventions differ pending, uh, depending on whether you're in a containment or later on dubbed as a zero COVID approach, or whether you are in mitigation where you have spread of a virus or disease in your community and you just try to mitigate the impact of that and uh, how those different types of interventions fall into one or the other category. What I didn't have in my cards at that point is that we kept combining containment and mitigation strategies for a very long time and well into the vaccine era. Um, I was too pessimistic in terms of vaccine. It only took nine months rather than 12 months. And I think that was the, uh, the biggest achievement the scientific community was able to get together throughout the pandemic. And I said masks were not recommended back in March, 2020. And as I would, everyone remember a couple months later, they started to get mandated across the province at the country. In the healthcare setting, mask respirator will come back to, and in terms of treatments out of those four, five um, uh, options that are listed here as candidates, only one survived when they severe, but we got others uh, like nematrelvir, ritonavir, dexamethasone, tocilizumab, and baroticinib, which all were able to reduce mortality along the way. Uh, September 2020, I touched for the first time on air travel, basically saying there's not an awful lot happening uh, with air travel in terms of transmission during flights and why that's the case. Um, in May 2022, I um, dedicated my part of the presentation on travel restrictions. And uh, some key takeaways from then were I showed uh, Marek Smeyer's study here on uh, border testing and would have mentioned the potential harm for PCR testing in a post-Omicron um, um, era where lots of people have had an infection in January, February during the height of the Omicron wave and may have still had positive PCRs. So you ended up with um, epidemiologically relevant positives which had major impact on international travel and resulted in a lot of costs individually as well as uh, 
federally. Um, take home messages in terms of the review of the literature around travel restrictions were that any type of border measures will likely have some effect with very low to low certainty and a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how impactful they are and heavily affect so many factors such as level of community transmission at home, the broader context, other public health measures basically were involved when you have stay at home orders, but do very little to nothing if you had a uh, very significant transmission at home anyways, and how the implementation of compliance looked like. And basically that the gradient in terms of incidence or prevalence became irrelevant once you had significant transmission. Different topic, if you had low domestic transmission, then it was a more complex decision from a policy perspective. And that there's two options you can go in my my mind, the simple but wrong answer, which is testing and guaranteeing likely do something, and we must continue as long as SARS-CoV circulates. And that's where we had been back then uh, in, in 2022, or more complex answers. It really depends on, on the nuances of the scenario. And uh, we did, a, a Zane and I and a couple of colleagues did an uh, extensive review of the travel literature and we presented those findings in September 23rd on behalf of the Canadian Travel and Tourism Roundtable. And probably coincidentally, the Government of Canada issued a news release on September 26th that travel restrictions are to be lifted by October 1st, 2022. Last theme before I hand over to, to Sane is medical masks and N95 respirators. I first introduced the, um, the concept of droplets and aerosols not being like two separate categories uh, in June 2020. And I have said that's basically a gradient. And from a policy perspective, yes, there's that artificial separation into two also in terms of what it means in terms of interventions. Um, but there were many calls, as you probably remember, might have been part of that um, N95 should be mandatory, at least for COVID or 24-7 in hospital care. Um, I also um, showed the study by uh, Derek Chu and uh, Volker Schunemann in, much more, in very much detail. That was one of the drivers of that discussion at the time. And I criticized more the studies that were put into that systematic review than the systematic review itself, because as you may remember from earlier in my presentation today, the, the level of evidence in many of those in particular early COVID studies were poor. And um, this is all that was available at that point of time. And I would have emphasized the clinical and statistical heterogeneity in the uh, meta-analysis. And I would have argued that um, in order to run or drive policy, you would like to have RCTs, meta-analysis of RCTs, well done observational studies. And I would have made a point that more than ever before, we need RCTs on this topic, but also on many other uh, COVID related topics, uh, which unfortunately not happened to a large extent, but I will come back to this particular study that was run by Mark Good. Um, I would also have talked about in May 2021 again, why we see such high transmission rates and all those factors that played into that with the PPE discussion, which took a lot of, of room and space uh, over time, was really only about the bottom piece, the less effective, uh, least effective part of the entire hierarchy of controls that we have in place to prevent any type of, of transmissions. And I would have discussed in details the pros and cons uh, in terms of aerosols, so the small respiratory particles being likely dominant versus being less important. And I suggested two potential reconciliations. One is um, you just run with the precautionary principle, which comes with the challenge that you have to draw the line somewhere between only for HMPs and positive or suspected patient all the way to all human to human interaction outdoors. And as you remember over the years, we always, we, we kept the HMP part pretty much throughout in terms of precautionary principle for N95 respirator requirements. 
we went back and forth with uh, N95s for non-HMP care of suspected and confirmed cases. We never went into um, the community with respirators in Canada, but Austria is an example of a, of a country that decided they put that um, line in, in the sand for the precautionary principle even further down and made it mandatory in shops and public transport. Austria didn't do any better or worse in terms of mortality than their peer countries in, in Europe. So I wouldn't draw any conclusions on whether that worked or not on that. I provided a more nuanced um, approach to, um, to the reconciliation of this entire issue and would have said that um, there's probably settings where you may want to consider um, an N95, which would be old buildings with bad ventilation when you have an outbreak there. So for example, an old nursing home and to build that into, into PCRA. Never made it into policy really, um, but uh, those were the thoughts I shared back then. Um, Mark Lope's study got published eventually and showed non-inferiority of uh, medical masks compared to N95 in, in healthcare. And on the right-hand side, you have the latest recommendations by Public Health Ontario on PPE. And basically for healthcare work, it is medical mask or N95 respirators. Um, for HMPs, it's N95 as the first mentioned or medical medical mask as the second mentioned. So it would be acceptable at this point as well. So the precautionary principle was further moved up or that line was further moved up at this point. And when you look at Ontario, and that's what I have at the bottom here, um, it was, we started off with N95 as we would for any novel virus based on what we've seen in terms of transmission patterns in, in China. It was scaled back to medical masks and also reminding people we had a huge lack of N95s to start with. So that was the only period of time where we actively restricted the use of N95 because we had to. Then there was a time period where N95 were preferred, but medical masks were, were accepted. Then there was a short period of time where um, N95 became mandatory during Omicron, then back to N95 preferred, and now full circle, we are back to medical mask or N95. So uh, a lot and lots and up and down or back and forth or standing still, I don't know, but um, this discussion still continues, obviously. And Without further ado, I hand it over to um, to say now to share his th thoughts on serology treatment and vaccines. Thank you. Thanks everyone, and thanks for having me today. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone, and thank you, Dominic, for presenting that. I think I'm presenting the wrong screen here, so let me just swap my displays. That should be right. Dominic, can you just tell me if that looks right? That looks right, same. Okay, perfect. Um, so these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, some of these products are going to be mentioned, but uh, but we'll refer to them by their generic name and just present evidence. And so I'm going to go through three pieces today, an update on seroprevalence, updates on vaccination, and then finally an update on therapeutics. And I think today's focus is very much present. Dominic did a really good job at describing past um, but uh, but I think you know we are dealing with um, you know a virus that has likely infected most in our society and that does really change our decision making. Um, vaccinations are widely available, um, and now we're, we're again having more deep and existential questions on on next vaccines, um, and then finally therapeutics in the context of again being very different than when these therapeutics were developed, uh, showing their efficacy. So, you know, I, you know, Dominic, I think when you were presenting these slides, you know, you felt January 2020, very young and, and immature at this and January 2024, just as if everyone has gone through a significant shared experience that uh, has made us older and wiser. And so, you know, I really want to frame this around this case because this really is the, the, the common concern or questions around uh, COVID-19 as it deals with in 2024. So this is a 71-year-old male. He's got hypertension, diastolic dysfunction. He's appropriately managed for his underlying conditions. He's here for routine follow-up. You know, as you're going into the respiratory season, so this is now October of 2023, you really do mention, you know, it's probably good to stay up to date on vaccines. 
Uh, we have now, you know, an RSV vaccine, we have influenza vaccines, and even data around influenza and reduction in cardiovascular mortality um, and, and COVID-19 vaccines. But, you know, the, the typical question I think patients are asking is, why do I need another dose of vaccine? He's already had four doses of the original vaccine. He'd had a bivalent vaccine. Um, and so he, um, he feels as if he's been protected adequately. Uh, and he thinks he had COVID-19 about a year ago. He had some typical upper respiratory tract symptoms, um, although he did a single rapid test that was negative. So uh, he isn't completely sure. And so, you know, I think there are two big questions that come out of this uh, in encounter. One is, what are the odds that he's had COVID-19 already? And the second is, what benefit comes with vaccination? So um, when we talk about seroprevalent studies, um, there are really two antibodies that are measured. One is anti-spike antibody, and this is the antibody that's made to spike protein. It is present with both vaccine and infection. It was the, you know, uh, as we did studies pre-vaccination was a very useful measure, um, but in a widely vaccinated population, obviously has challenges unless you know a vaccine history uh, in terms of interpreting what the anti-spike antibody means in terms of um, prior infection within a population. And then we have anti-nucleocapsid antibody, anti-N antibody, which is present with infection alone. It you know, refers to an intraviral element, which is not on the viral surface. Um, and so really, you can only get that with, with infection. It is the reference standard for, for prior infection that's widely accessible. There are better tests using T-cell function and, and other means, but there are caveats that apply. And, and before we really describe seroprevalence, um, this is a, a study that really does need to be visited. So this was actually an analysis of people who took the mRNA-1273 vaccine in the original clinical trial. This is spike vax or the Moderna vaccine. Um, and they looked at people at their serologic responses uh, in, uh, in folks that were seronegative at the beginning of the study, um, but then developed COVID-19 by seropositivity, basically. And you can see the study methodology there. Patients uh, would get their two vaccines and swabs on those days, uh, and they'd start looking at anti-N seropositivity at day one, um, uh, um, and then you know ongoing until the patient um, uh, patient de uh, derived uh, 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 testing basically based on symptom and and diary, um, and so uh, when you look at individuals who were um, uh, uh, vac who were not vaccinated, who were given placebo in these vaccines, as they developed COVID-19 during their journey in the clinical trial, uh, most of them were anti-N seropositive. You see a seropositivity rate of 93%. Um, unfortunately, as we have individuals that, in the again, small number that developed COVID-19 after, develop after receiving the Moderna vaccine, we see the anti-N seropositivity of about 40 to 50%. Now, this was a, an earlier assay, the Ellis assay, and there were some methodology issues that that you know may be better now in terms of using this measure. But just in the caveat of everything that you know, um, anti-N seropositivity, particularly in a population that experienced their COVID nineteen after vaccination, may not be a fully predictive measure and likely an underestimate of uh, full seroprotection within or full full seroconversion within a population. And so we have uh, two big studies that that look at seropositivity across. One is the Canadian Immunity Task Force data, um, uh, which are really multiple data sets. Uh, so from Canadian Blood Services in Hema, Quebec, uh, looking at random blood donors, um, samples from provincial laboratories, either discarded or extra samples, uh, and then a number of other smaller seroprevalence studies that were uh, funded and and, uh, and worked through this, this COVID immunity task force, looking at certain areas or, or, or particular um, populations that may have uh, not been represented in, in the above two. Um, you know, there are limitations, obviously, if you're using Canadian Blood Services data, there's healthy volunteer biases. The people that donate blood may be more um, likely to be vaccinated, more likely to be um, uh, positive health seeking behaviors. Um, people, um, uh, again, as I talked about, is the antibody decay with anti N. And then, you know, again, seroprevalence studies, particularly ones that are recruited, may also have healthy volunteer biases associated with them in, in that context. But, you know, this is really looking at where we are in the last update as of October of 2023. 
But seeing that, you know, we see this massive rise in anti-spike antibodies, which correlates very well to our vaccine campaign through early 2021, um, and, you know, almost approaching 100% by April of 2022 between the people who are vaccinated and the people who had had a prior infection after Omicron. Um, but we see um, COVID seroprevalence by uh, natural immunity, really, you know, small numbers in the 5% range by the time Omicron took off. And then this explosion during Omicron leading to about 80% um, seroprevalence. As we break things down by age, which is important, we see that younger populations were infected first uh, and were, you know, were, are the higher seroprevalent within the population. They, uh, they skew the curve towards that 80% or higher. And then older populations, particularly as median age gets to 70 and 80, uh, still have seroprevalences that are in the 60-ish percent range. And so, you know, you do see this age gradient and, and it does not affect some of the discussions we have around clinical decision-making and vaccination. Um, this is just looking at data around uh, deprivation as well as racialization and, and you know, it's not unexpected and even some work that we had published back uh, when the variants were first emerging in Toronto um, that uh, more deprived populations saw um, more COVID-19 at most points during the pandemic. There was a catch-up during Omicron where many other populations saw it. Um, but but that was the population that was ahead for most of the, the curve and still is ahead. And similarly, we see racialized populations being much highly, much more represented in terms of the entire curve versus non-racialized populations. This is a, a study that was done in British Columbia looking at seroprevalence uh, and used a, a pretty reasonable strategy. It's been doing this throughout the pandemic uh, where they took 2,000 samples from life labs um, of discarded blood. Uh, and essentially tested them serially during all of these uh, periods that's been going on for some time. Uh, and so actually probably is a representative um, of, of the population, recognizing that uh, certain healthy populations or younger populations may not be represented as much in terms of people getting routine blood work. But, you know, in, in, in the context of a general population sweep, randomized and, and again, no... Um, no volunteering for the study, um, you know, and, and doing it serially, we do get a better sense to this piece. And so, you know, we see that uh, um, seroprevalence uh, is high across all populations that um, people, you know, especially younger people are seeing 80 plus percent in, in British Columbia. Um, but you also still see this age gradient. Older people have become infected over time. But still, as of about a year ago, we see seroprevalences in, in 80 plus populations still being uh, under 50%. And so, you know, again, as we think about clinical decision making, and, and the numbers probably are, again, a bit of an underestimate and probably higher now dealing with uh, 2024, but just recognizing that certain populations have not seen COVID-19 still, and, and there is an age gradient, which is also the same gradient in terms of severity. And, and again, this really does affect some of the decision making we make. BC took one further step and used their case in contact, uh, as well as testing data, as well as models from the seroprevalence data in terms of trying to figure out by different periods of time uh, what the uh, uh, hospitalization rate as well as uh, 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 fatality rate um, for first infections amongst populations are. Um, this is including vaccinated populations, but really recognizing that that first infection is probably the most serious um, you know, have things changed with newer vaccines, with treatments, um, and with everything else going on. And so, you know, I think, and this is logarithmic, so so it may be a bit deceiving, but we do see the hospitalization rate, you know, in twenty early twenty 2020 twenty to to twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two being quite high for the seventy to seven eighty year old population. Some of this is skewed by people that are in hospital for other reasons and outbreaks, um, but but you know, certainly in the, in that between one and ten percent range. But as we see more vaccinations, even in that 80-year-old population, which is, again, the highest risk population by age, we see that in that you know year ago period that the uh, hospitalization rate is still kind of in the, the, that percentage, but the, the fatality rate is really getting closer to 1% or less. We see younger groups really doing well 
in, throughout all of these periods in that sense. So this is probably the best data we have in terms of what an average individual of a particular age, knowing the population, experiencing their COVID-19 has of becoming hospitalized and dying. And, you know, I think it's no surprise that uh, it's, um, uh, it's older people that are still facing risk, but but the numbers are not as high as they were at the beginning of the pandemic, where we're seeing 10 and even 30% mortality amongst greater than 80 year olds. So I think in summary, infection induced zero prevalence is high, young racialized income groups are the highest, some groups are still experiencing first infection and that frames our next two discussions. And then finally, IFR and IHR has dropped markedly, but still has a strong age gradient. So this is then moving into vaccination and treatment. Um, and so, you know, this is the theme, I think, of the next two bits of this presentation, that we have a clinical trial period with low population immunity, more severe variants, low exposure burden, low vaccination and therapeutics. Um, and then we now have uh, 2024, where we have high population immunity, less severe variants, a very high exposure burden. I mean, COVID is circulating uh, and very high vaccination rates. And so how do we reconcile uh, what's going on in the context of um, uh, making clinical decisions for individuals for prevention and treatment in the current reality based on clinical trials um, that are fairly outdated. And, you know, the, the real reality of the fact is that we had industry sponsored RCTs in 2020. We are now dealing with retrospective cohort studies to really make our clinical decisions. There is one post-marketing antiviral randomized clinical trial that has been published. It's for molnupiravir, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, but that really does um, beg the question, A, that our research uh, um, portfolio has been you know, severely decimated, but B, you know, we are using studies that have inherent biases in terms of matching, in terms of um, uh, uh, identification, recognizing that people don't come for, for uh, testing like they did in 2020. Um, and so really we are making assessments and matching based on flawed data, you know, and, uh, and, you know, we can see trends, but at the same time, it's, it's, uh, it's making decisions based on data that should be much better at this point in time. So in terms of vaccinations, the, the big questions, do vaccinations prevent infection? How long, how well do novel vaccinations work against a baseline population? And how do we rationalize decisions now in the context of vaccine fatigue and refusal, side effects, economic costs, and resource limitations. So this is modeling data from North Carolina using a large data set that's been going on through the pandemic, essentially a statewide case and contact management system uh, looking at vaccination status amongst individuals. There is obviously biases here in terms of who gets tested, um, but that really informs infection, hospitalization, hospitalization, or death, and death. And, and again, this is matched to a cohort that had not received a booster. And you know, model they they, they suggested a thirty percent efficacy against infection that declines uh, against the baseline population, which is a population that has um, prior vaccines and prior um, immunity through infection. Um, so, so not a naive population, but a 30% effectiveness on top in terms of preventing infection, um, a 40 to 50% hospitalization that doesn't decline as quickly as infection. In fact, last 22 weeks in the study, um, hospitalization and death in the same category and death in the same category. So more benefits to severe disease that last longer um, and, uh, and a short benefit to infection, which does decline over you know, 12 to 16 weeks. They modeled this out for periods where BA4-5, which were the targets of last vaccine, uh, were circulating, uh, as well as the period where XBB uh, started uh, emerging in, in about a year ago. Uh, and you know we do see that uh, the lines get a little bit more um, sharp in, in terms of curves uh, uh, dropping off as XBB emerged, and not unreasonable considering that there was some antigenic shift. There was still protection, but um, it wasn't as uh, as robust as when the vaccines were very well matched to the population. One of the questions that's asked is, what, what are the benefits of bivalent vaccines in populations that have had COVID-19? This was a large Italian retrospective cohort, uh, again, uh, um, based on a, 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 a countrywide uh, case and contact management system, matching individuals by vaccine status as well as prior infection status, and then the receipt of a bivalent vaccine last year. 
uh, looking at uh, hospitalization. And they actually did a sensitivity analysis trying to limit hospitalization to people who are hospitalized for legitimate COVID-19 concerns. Uh, and we see across the board that there was a relative vaccine efficacy in terms of preventing hospitalization of about 60% in getting a vaccine in a high-risk population, so over the age of 60, um, that was seen throughout the study. One of the um, uh, you know questions is, is when should people get a vaccine uh, after a prior infection? And in this study, that the benefits were seen as of six months or later after a prior infection. But under that six-month point, there was actually very minimal benefit, in fact, no benefit in terms of protecting against uh, an, uh, uh, a second infection uh, after getting a bivalent vaccine. And so NASI's recommendations of six months are actually quite reasonable and, and I would I would uh, say evidence-based. And you know, I think although we vaccinate a bit sooner for individuals at their request, the vast majority, even of the high-risk population, should probably adhere to um, the six-month rule for vaccine standards if they're immunocompetent. This is our first look at some of the um, uh, XBB vaccine data from the Netherlands. Uh, this was a cut till December uh, 5th, so very still premature, um, but looking at um, vaccine uptake as well as relative vaccine efficacy against baseline, so people that had had prior vaccines and infection versus people who had gotten a seasonal vaccine. Um, and so, you know, we we see in this cohort that there was again about a sixty to seventy percent uh, protection against hospitalization in a high risk sixty plus population, uh, in about a, a seventy three percent against admission. The numbers are very small, um, and you see uptake in that population over time was relatively low in that sixty to seventy five year old category, but quite high actually in that seventy five plus year or twenty plus percent in that seventy five plus category. So. No, I think we can make the argument for older populations and higher risk populations. Um, you know, one of the questions that get, gets asked is, is there any symptomatic benefit to being vaccinated over time? This was data from a large uh, adaptive clinical trial in the United States by David Bulaware, uh, who looked at symptom reduction by time of last vaccine and did see that there was a um, a nominal difference between people who had had a primary series of vaccine, a booster vaccine, or no vaccine in terms of COVID-19 total symptom score over time. So, you know, there may be a couple of extra days in terms of reduction of symptoms as well associated with, uh, with uh, being up to date with vaccine. And the, But this really does lead to vaccine policies that are dichotomous. So the UK actually had a vaccine policy that was, uh, you know, older individuals, people who have clinical risks, and these are Fairly uh, significant risk factors, um, uh, but but you know the typical diseases that we associate with moderate to severe COVID nineteen, healthcare workers and social care workers, immunosuppressed individuals, and carers for uh, older adults. They modeled this was about just over a third of the population, and they actually did some modeling uh, in terms of how many averted deaths, hospitalizations, and ICU stays would they have with either tightening it up from that left criteria, leaving that left criteria, or just opening it up to the general population um, based on that criteria. Um, and you know the, the, the bottom line here is that the averted hospitalizations and ICU stays are trivially different uh, with immunizing 38% of the population with these clinical criteria versus immunizing the entire population. So, you know, this is where the UK advice came from. This is actually based, the modeling is based on their own internal data. You know, so, so you know, I, I think we we do consider that, you know, policies like this may exist in the context of, you know, really targeting interventions and and, uh, and education towards highest risk groups. Canada, Canada's vaccine policy still follows that higher risk group piece, but there is more of a larger recommendation for individuals after six months in that context. Um, there may be a symptom reduction. There, you know, I'm not going to talk about long COVID just for the sake of the, the length of this presentation. But you know, you can see where two different approaches do come apart. Come apart in that that um, rationalizing this is not easy in a 2024 standpoint. So you know, you have a conversation, and he books an appointment at the pharmacy. He develops a cough with a sore throat just before his immunization date, as seems to be the story. Um, and he has a positive rapid test and he calls your office saying, can I get early therapy? Again, I want to go back to where we are in 2024. So molnupiravir, which is an old drug uh, that was approved, one of the first drugs that, was, uh, that had a clinical study published, saw about a 10% uh, um, 
risk of hospitalization or death in the um, placebo group and uh, uh, about a six-ish percent uh, uh, hospitalization or death rate in the Molnupiravir group. Um, so, you know, a 50, relatively 50% relative risk reduction. When they tried to do a randomized clinical trial in the UK, this is the only randomized clinical trial of an antiviral after post-marketing release, um, they actually had a 1% hospitalization rate in either category. Now, there were some systematic differences here, particularly in a vaccinated and Omicron population. But just to say, you know, we are not dealing with 10% as the criteria for even these studies that are trying to recruit people that are high risk. We're dealing with 1% or less, um, which really does, you know, present challenges into who benefits, particularly with side effects and other considerations. And so early treatment is not the same. There's one RCT approved, again, despite all of this um, post-approval. And we're really, again, using retrospective cohort studies. Uh, making judgments in 2024 is difficult. And, and the only thing I will say is monoclonal antibodies are not part of the treatment regimen just because of antigenic shift. This is Ontario data looking at the experience from uh, 2022 for higher risk populations who were able to get Paxlovid that they saw a 56% uh, reduction in odds. Uh, along with uh, getting um, Paxlovid versus not getting Paxlovid. Um, the benefits were seen more in the greater than 70 population, the under-vaccinated population, the more comorbid population, uh, which is seen both in comorbidities three or more, or the OST group standard, uh, uh, high versus standard, um, and uh, and really during even periods where different variants were, were circulating. Um, you know, again, we we're talking about number needed to treat of 62 at baseline, but the really bang for the bucks are older, more comorbid um, uh, individuals. Uh, the long-term care was a bit tricky because of DDIs and access, so um, that data is a little bit more messy in this context. This is Quebec data using very similar methodology. Um, and uh, similarly saw benefits in people who were uh, incomplete vaccines, older and who had not received a vaccine recently, um, and uh, immunocompromised. Uh, and so, you know, again, as we're talking about rationalizing this, there are groups that keep sticking out in these retrospective data sets that seem to be uh, the ones that have the, uh, the more risk and in, in, in more benefit in, in early therapy. This is actually a British Columbia data that really had a more restrictive approach. Uh, and so CEV1 are highly immunocompromised. These are transplants and BMTs. Uh, CEV2 are moderately immunocompromised, so people on biologics or anti-metabolites. And CEV3 are kind of very, very severe underlying comorbidities, so like end-stage COPD with hospitalizations. Um, and then XL is really age and, and lower risk comorbidities or lower um, severe comorbidities. And they were able, again, to show that, that the number to treat is highest in the more immunocompromised populations. That's a population that seems to stick out and I think is very reasonable. Um, but the CEV3 population sees a little bit of a drop off, although these are still significant. When we get to CEV, the EXEL, which is the, the uh, person with you know, hypertension and CHF, um, uh, they don't actually fit um, statistical significance in this retrospective cohort. So, you know, again, BC's approach has actually been quite restrictive and, and based on their own data. One other question that gets asked uh, in, in the context is what do we do about patients in hospital who get COVID through nosocomial uh, exposures? This is Hong Kong data where in the BA2 wave, many individuals were admitted for COVID-19 uh, who were uh, not needing hospitalization, but was used as an isolation facility, uh, where they started some of them who are at risk on uh, uh, neurotrolivir tonavir. They did see this composite outcome of invasive mechanical ventilation ICU uh, and uh, oxygen, as well as all-cause mortality, being lower in individuals that did get neurotrolivir ritonavir. So, you know, again, the argument could be made, even though the drug was meant to prevent hospitalization, there may be benefits in high-risk populations who were in hospital to prevent the progression into severe outcomes. Um, I won't go over criteria, but just recognizing BC is on the left and Ontario is on the right, they are widely different criteria, um, but based on the clinical data, the left criteria, which is British Columbia's, is actually probably closer to um, what the data shows as compared to the right criteria where it's not as, uh, it's pretty wide open. Um, so that's the bottom line. Um, I will say neurotrolovirotonavir is available through outpatient pharmacies. There is some drug interactions and drug can be used in CKD despite the monograph. We have data around dosing. 
Remdesivir is there for those intolerant. It's given in three days. It is available to all clinicians through outpatient uh, uh, home and community care services. Um, the forms are on the stjoes.ca MAB clinic or HFAM website. There is a high resource utilization associated with this drug because of the uh, nursing needs. And so it should be used in people who would benefit from outpatient treatment, but cannot take Paxlovid, and particularly because of um, uh, adverse drug reactions, or, or sorry, or um, drug drug interactions. So lastly, I present this case. Um, he ends up in the hospital. He's hypoxic on two liters of oxygen. There's his x-ray. He's a febrile, his CRP is five. His COVID test really shows a low viral load. And you admit him and think about inpatient therapies. And, you know, I, I think at the practical point here is that our inpatient therapies have not changed dexamethasone, tocilizumab, barcetinib, anticoagulation, remdesivir. But COVID pneumonitis or COVID pneumonia is not the common presentation of COVID-19 anymore. It is often these dehydration weakness, hyperglycemia, and airway disease flare, CHF, secondary pneumonia, and cognitive changes. And I think we have to consider that as part of how we assess these patients, whether or not they need therapies. And so, you know, this example, you know, the heart, there's heart failure on the x-ray, and that's, you know, on examination, the clinical presentation, you do want to be careful about giving dexamethasone here, even though the data shows in COVID pneumonia this works, this isn't necessarily a patient from 2020. This is a patient who may have a mild infection that tipped over their underlying disease. Um, and you want to be, make sure that you're not introducing more harm with the therapies rather than benefit. Lastly, the future, uh, mucosal vaccines and pan coronavirus vaccines, combined vaccines, and new therapeutics. There have been a, a few that have been trialed. But again, one of the big issues that's coming out of this is how do you define efficacy recognizing that, um, you know, if we're dealing with a 1% or less hospitalization rate, even in a high-risk recruited population, how will we define if these drugs work? Um, uh, and, you know, a lot of these trials are now using symptom reduction endpoints, which is great, but but really isn't necessarily from a health system standpoint, um, uh, 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 you know, going to be a, a, a big seller in terms of uh, being able to use this more aggressively. Um, with that, I think I'll flip it to questions, given that we're just over time by a couple of minutes. Yeah, so <clears throat> we let's just take one, two quick questions, although we're over time for those who can hang around, that would be great. Thanks uh, to Zane and Dominic, not only for a great summary um, uh, today, but of all the care that, and attention that they and all the people who they work with have put in up to this enormous effort over the last couple of years. Dominic, when I said at the start, I thought you'd underestimate it. it was more around the duration because that initial graph sort of showed an initial surge and then it would all be over with. And here we are four, year, four years later and still talking about it. Um, I have one quick question and I'm going to bring up one of the questions that's brought up in the in the question answer, then we'll end. So the question I have is, are, are antigen tests useful anymore? And the reason I ask that is I keep hearing people tell me that they have, you know, they went to a party, there were people there who subsequently tested positive they now have symptoms. They've tested themselves with an antigen test. They're negative. I worry that there's a false reassurance going around if it's important. What are your thoughts? I think you're on mute, Dominic. Oh, is that for Dominic or for me? Sorry. Whoever. Oh. Do you want to go ahead, Dominic? <laughs> uh, I, I can try. So, um, I, I think I hear the same, let me put it that way, that there's probably more false negative than, than they have always been in the past. Um, I cannot quantify how by how much the sensitivity may be worse, if at all, nowadays than it had been when those tests had been rolled out and made, made available. Um, as with many things COVID related, once we are out of, of mandatory doing X and Y, I think it's it should be in individual decisions. And if someone has rapid antigen tests and wants to use them, they should go ahead and do so. Um, but you have to keep in mind that they are certainly not 100% sensitive. And then the question is, what do you do with the results? If you want to entirely avoid exposing someone and you're doing a test that you know may only be 70% sensitive, then you have to ask yourself whether that's enough for yourself or not. Uh, there are not, no other options though, right? You're not going mm. to do a PCR test for that purpose. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I've heard the same stories. 
there might be a hit to, to how sensitive they are. But I, I haven't seen any actual data. I'm not sure we're the same, so I need. And I think the other issue that you have to keep in mind as well is that many of those tests have been expired in the meantime, if you got them early during the pandemic, which probably has a hit on sensitivity as well. Perfect. And the other question I'll just bring up really quickly because we are over time is this issue of someone's asked how, if so Zane, you touched on this, but how effective is Paxlovid, i.e., you know, if, if uh, I asked you this question, Dominic, in Poland, you may remember I'm a hypertensive, obese, 57 year old male. Um, if I get COVID, I've never had a positive test somehow. I, it's impossible. I haven't had it. Uh, you know, should I, should I take Paxlovid? Realizing I'd have to fiddle around with my resuvastatin. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the data, at least from the three Canadian provinces, suggests that the people that benefit the most are over 70, particularly clustered with comorbidities and immunocompromised. What's the number needed to treat for someone like yourself? You know, is it 200? Is it 300? Does dysagusia, GI symptoms, and drug-drug interactions, modifications, you know, create a risk-benefit profile that is much more risk than benefit? Um, you know, so I think... The, the bottom line is, um, you know, we we have very poor data in 2024 in terms of how to navigate this. I think we the retrospective series show that high risk groups are high risk, um, but it is, um, you know, the, the under 70 year old population, the benefits there describing them and counseling people around them who are not immunocompromised uh, and don't have end stage uh, underlying disease. It's it's hard to say. Like uh, it, it's probably number needed to treats in the hundreds to thousands in that sense, right? Yeah, I will say, Zane, you know this. I did the COVID clinic a couple of times at the height of things, and when you see people who do have multiple comorbidities that put them at risk of severe disease, and you give them either remdesivir or Paxlovid, it's remarkably effective. You know, they return at twenty four hours feeling dramatically better. Yeah. So there's no doubt that in the right target group of patients, those drugs are remarkably effective, more, way more than I expected to be based on personal observation. Anyway, we should end there. We're seven minutes over. Uh, thanks to both of you again for all the hard work, not, not only today, but in general. Thanks to the audience. Next week, we'll return Thursday at noon with uh, Dr. Verhofsex and Dr. Azam's regular set of rounds, and Chair's Grand's Round will be back in uh, two months from now. Thanks, everybody, and have a great uh, 2024. Thank you.